Sweet. Oh, gotta love the pre tech preamble that always starts off these sessions. So, um, yes, welcome everyone to How to Be More Pirate tonight. I am Alex. I'm the newly formed captain of our Be More Pirate crew. Uh, I started working with Sam about two years ago. I started off as a right-hand pirate, um, answering probably the world's most unusual job advert that really only had two lines and simply said, I need someone to help me create some impact out of my book, Be More Pirates. And I also need someone who's going to stop me from disappearing up my own ass. And this is a daily challenge that I still undergo. But you probably um, are not expecting us to be looking like this tonight, but a bit more like this. What we're going to do tonight is not only um, bust some of the myths about pirates, but also take you on a bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the modern pirates that have formed our crew, some of the businesses, entrepreneurs, and crews that have formed as a result of taking the ideas in Sam's book and putting them into practice, which has been what our new book is all about. Um, it's the result of all these incredible people all around the world taking the idea of mutiny and making it real. But we're gonna start right at the very beginning. Are we not, Sam? Indeed. Uh, <clears throat> I spent my whole life wanting to change the world in some way, shape or form and never really knowing exactly how I was going to do that. I used to think that the raves I ran as a teenager were saving the world in some way with no real idea how dancing till six in the morning was doing anything for anyone other than it's you know inherently good for you. Um, I took that on all manner of places and adventures around the world into the wonderful world of social enterprise and found myself winning all the awards that there were from Social Entrepreneur of the Year to Social Enterprise of the Year and eventually found myself really disenchanted by this whole kind of space um we had great times and uh, uh, you know the 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 accolades felt good in the moment but underneath it all there was this growing question as time wore on that the world i seemed to be wanting to set out to change was was getting worse the 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 the, the stitches were coming out of the edges and our work was always in and around young people disadvantaged communities and it just seemed that it was all getting less and less and less fair and as i got the chance to work with more and more senior leaders around the world from prime ministers to to heads of multinationals I got less and less impressed and the vacuum of imagination at the top of most organizations left me wondering and what I had the inspiration that came from was from what I called my my pirates who were young entrepreneurs social entrepreneurs and social innovators I'm very lucky to work from Bradford to Baltimore and from Athens to to to, to Cape Town with incredible young creative entrepreneurs the likes of which the York Festival is is here to to support and it was at them that I wrote this book for. I didn't know that there were any real pirates in the world left, um, which luckily, and there's a real pirate on the call in Captain Tons re-educated me. I was using it as a metaphor, the idea of the young rebels who can really change the world. And the last thing in the world that they should do, that any of us should do, is believe that the grown-ups know what they're doing. I say that for Arthur. Um, and actually it's upon all of us to disregard those rules and step into the space of writing some of our own. And so for me, the most difficult rule was to step away from the, 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 the trappings of like safety and social enterprise and push right back out into a world that I didn't truly understand what was gonna happen. And at about the same time, I was coming to many of the same conclusions as Sam was about this idea of there being a bit of a vacuum of leadership and and just feeling an increasing sense of disillusionment at the places that where I'd tried and sought inspiration for so many years, thinking that they had the answers, that actually these, the people that were talking about change the most were the least invested in really, really making it happen. I spent seven years working at somewhere called the RSA. I'm sure many of you know it. Um, it bears the tagline 21st century enlightenment um, and began with really, really radical roots back in the you know 1600s, the same time as the golden age of piracy pioneering like a new society to that would admit women that would um, challenge the injustices we were seeing at the dawn of the industrial revolution and yet as time goes on institutions often become sucked into the mainstream and so I spent seven years there and by the end of those seven years was left with this sinking feeling much the same as Sam of like this isn't where change is going to really happen this is not where it's coming from and so I left and went off seeking something new, except I didn't really know what that was. Um, I actually just went and sat on a beach for four months and sort of kicked my disillusionment into the sand. Um, and it was about that time that I picked up Be More Pirate. And the first time I picked it up, I actually put it down straight away after reading two pages, because I could hear the echoes of Sam's kind of save the world narrative. And I thought, here's another dude with an idea to save the world, but 
I didn't want to hear it. Um, it was only when I saw the job advert for Right Hand Pirate that I actually came back to it and read the whole thing properly. And although I still had a lot of questions, I fundamentally thought this is a different way of presenting social change. There is momentum and energy and surprises in this that I had never seen before. And it really piqued my curiosity. So I came back to London and interviewed with Sam and came with all the challenge, not least because I felt that his 5R framework that runs through the book was a little bit convenient. Five R alliterative R's, rebel, stand up to the status quo, rewrite your rules, reorganize yourselves, redistribute power and retell your story, weaponize your story. Um, so I said, you know, is it, is this book more style over substance? And he just said, you tell me. And we had this, you know, we had this open conversation about what this could be. What he'd experienced so far was a, a, an overwhelm of people coming forth with rebellions that they were starting. And so that's what this today is all about. Um, those people who came forward and put the ideas into practice. What it's not about is um, the trite stereotypes of pirates that we've, we've grown up with, that Walt Disney has compounded with its corny accents and costumes that have become the mainstay of children's birthday parties. Um, Be More Pirate is not that. It's lots of other different things instead. It's um, become to mean many things to many people. It's certainly not just rebellion and rule breaking, and that's what I've learned from our community. It's also about democracy and inequality and fairness and collaboration and fundamentally truth telling, which is where we're going to start tonight. Um, we've done this in lots and lots of different workshops and talks over time, and it is like the kickstart, the stopping off point at the first step of how to be more pirate, getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, asking the difficult question. So for the next 60 seconds, we're just going to put that out to the group. What is the most difficult question that you could ask Sam or I? Something, you know, that is awkward and eye-watering and maybe it's been going around your head, but you've never quite found the balls to ask it yet. Please put some difficult questions in the chat and we will open the floor. We tend to find that, you know, as human beings, there's thoughts going around our heads and then there's a big difference between what's really going around the room, what we'd like to say and, and what we feel we're able to say. And this begins to push on what we mean by the rules. We're not here to necessarily pull apart some of the regulations or, or some of the aspects of smart rules that are there to serve us or save us. What we're really interested in is the norms and the habits that, that, that conform and, and create limitations around us. Did we go to private school? What will we lose? Always a concern. Good question. Uh, did I go to private school? No, I did not. I went to a really shit school uh, that got shut down after um, the CS gas incident in the language labs uh, that I can tell you about afterwards if we have time. I did not go to private school either. I went to grammar school though, which is a different kind of, you know, depends on how you feel about grammar schools, quite controversial. It definitely gave me competitive, a competitive upbringing in terms of feeling like you have to be the best and be perfect all the time? What will we lose is a really good question. Um, and one that we must ask ourselves. We simply can't, you can't have a conversation with about change meaningfully and then not be ready to lose something. We can't talk about the state the world is in. We can't talk about the environmental crisis. We can't talk about the erosion of democracy without being willing to lose something, without being too willing to let go of it. It's horrible to just intellectualize the ideas of change and not recognize that there is just simply too much stuff. So we really do have to make a choice about losing something. So many good questions coming through. I'm just going to pick a few at random. Um, I really liked, um, is this all, is talking about this all a waste of time? Well, yeah, we think it is fundamentally. I have been in more talking shops about change than you can possibly imagine. And I got so fed up of it. And that is why I'm here always pushing people, hopefully to the brink of what are you actually going to do within the next week? And we'll get to that later. The emphasis does not always have to be on the young whatsoever. My experience is in working with young people and I very much have come to terms with that pirate as we position it is absolutely a state of mind. And there's quite a few of our pirates uh, on the call. I can see Gary, I can see Tons, I can see others. Um, and it's absolutely non-exclusive in age or any other kind of way whatsoever. And it's one of the things that make me proudest about this. In fact, I think there are more uh, women in our pirate movement than there are anywhere else. It's now gone fully international. So there's no, there's no age or any other limitations to this. Ooh, did you want to be a rebel before you had something to rebel against? Um, 
That is a damn good question, one I'm going to have to think about. Uh, yeah, I always did. Um, I've always felt like an outsider. I've always felt like I'm not really invited to the party. I've got some fairly deep issues. And, uh, and therefore, I've always been a bit cross with the way things are. And I, I worry now, now I've kind of got my way, what it is that I'm going to rebel against next. <laughs> what do I wish I'd done differently with Be More Pirate? Um, I've just done it and we'll come back to that point. So I'll reference that in a little while, but um, it's all about getting out of the way. What is property? Well, we'll ask, we'll tell you how to join the cult at the end. <laughs> um, how do we different, how are we different from all the other, other influencers out there? Um, that will be for you to make up your mind at the end of this presentation. Maybe you'll end up feeling that we're not any different. Um, and I would say that we're different in the, the way that we work. We have a very transparent way of working. We share things pretty evenly. Um, we don't wait with brands who would ever change anything that we'd say. We'd never take anything other than our honest and frank approach. And when we have been asked to tone the message down or change it by brands, we've simply said, no. Mm -hmm. uh, am I truly happy? No, no, I'm not. I've really struggled with happiness over the last couple of years. I've gone through a lot of personal turbulence. Um, and I felt really, really anxious and quite lost, uh, particularly over the last few months. And I'm very grateful to several people around me who've helped me get back on board this ship. But I'd give myself a six hour or seven out of 10 most days if I'm lucky. Um, but I find in this and this mission and this community around me an awful sense of purpose and support. And that's probably the closest thing I've got to happiness at the moment. And I'm going to answer, answer one last one, I think. Um, well, actually two, because I'm going to wrap Dina's in two and one. How do we get pirates into every council? You know the answer is flat pack democracy and maybe we can come back to chatting about that at the end. But the second one, ha what happens when everyone is a pirate? Well, I don't think that um, pirate, and Sam agrees that pirate is a permanent state of being. You have to pick your moment to be pirate. It is a way of being that continually disrupts itself. And so if you always kind of in pirate mode, always with your cutlass out, um, it doesn't work. The idea of writing new rules from the edges is that eventually they're adopted by the mainstream and then there is a need for new piracy again and so the cycle continues but we will get into that because these are bloody amazing questions and not what we usually get right sam yeah yeah, yeah. you completely uh shattered the the, <laughs> the next thing that i was going to say um and i'm really happy to to answer every single one of those that we haven't if we've got some time at the end i'm happy to stick around and do it otherwise we'll get the uh the download of these questions there's nothing there that i'm I'm scared to answer. I'd particularly like to answer your question, Patrick, about the business model. Um, what happens normally when we ask this question, actually it partly answers that. The, the way that this took off, when I was um, beginning this process, all everybody said to me is books don't make any money. What are you going to do? And I was leaving a social enterprise that I'd found and I really didn't have a plan as to what comes next. And, and I fell into the world of uh, being asked to take the idea of pirates into businesses and, and they began to pay for, you know, as they do for workshops and innovation and, and the off, off, obvious bullshit. And we found a way to counter some of that bullshit and do something that led to actual change. And that's the thing that brings Alex and I together. There, there is change. So yes, there are people that pay us to do it, but we only stick to the principles that we've got. And in those principles, we start the sessions with this. And we ask what the most difficult question is. And usually no one can ask a difficult question. This is the first time this has ever happened. So congratulations, you bloody pirates. Um, normally people ask questions about sex. And that's as far as it goes. Maybe they'll ask questions about money if you're, you know, if they're really out there. And this is, of course, in a work setting. And usually it's less than about 5% of the room. And so we make this point, and it's an easy way to kind of a 101 into piracy because it's about telling the truth. It's about challenging the order. It's about challenging the status quo. And you've proven that you're able to do that with some relatively good, hard questions. But what we found was that in the kind of corporate environment, when the need for change is so profoundly great, touching on some of the questions, you know, what, what could, you know, why are we so devoutly disposed to the notion of making money? We're in these organizations where the narrative of change is outside, where the spirit of creativity is everywhere you see, but actually within organizations, all we see is real conformity. And in those environments, what we see truly is a, is a dichotomy of dishonesty. So we saw time and again, the questions that were and weren't being answered. And we began to kind of back this theory up with a survey, a workforce survey of the United Kingdom, where we asked this, this line, specifically this question, have you, oh, wait a minute, I'm gonna have to, make myself disappear. Have you sat in a meeting and verbally agreed to align around an idea whilst internally disagreeing completely? Can you have any kind of guess, you know, where would you be on this? Have you recently sat and said you've agreed to something which actually you know you've disagreed with? It turns out if you have, you'd be amongst the absolute majority. Was 
85% of us in our jobs will agree to things out loud that we absolutely disagree with. And this gets really interesting with the next question. Having said that, have you ever undertaken an action to then sabotage the thing that you agreed to? The answer is that 64% of us have said yes. What that means in a meeting of seven people, sorry if they're a bit blurred, um, but I can tell you the headline is that 85% of people are walking around saying yes to things that they don't agree with. And then 64% of people are then sabotaging the things they said yes to in meetings. And that isn't a surprise to anyone. That is the norm, the norm of work environments in this, in this country. And that's why this, this point about asking difficult questions isn't just a trite conversation starter. It's an honest reflection on how things are done and the dishonesty that sits amongst all of us and our inability to speak the truth. And that's one of the reasons why we came back to a place of pirates. Why this, this true story of pirates, is, as Alex said, not the Walt Disney equivalent that was given to us. When you start to look into it, you find some really interesting alternatives. And, and you'll find them in the modern pirates. I, I'd like, I haven't met Steve the pirate, but you'll find it in the other the, the pirate community that with us. This searing ability to tell the truth and to ask the difficult questions as you've got us off to quite a good start with. It would be Gary Austin pointing out that my slides are quite blurred. Thank you, Gary. You could do with some help on it. Um, if you've got your pumpkin and you could show that, I'd like to share that too. Amongst these, Black Sam Bellamy is one of my uh, absolute favourites. There are many of them that do so, but the reason I like Black Sam is he kind of sums up the spirit of the moment um, with some of the quotations that he was alleged to have said. He was also known as the Prince of Pirates, the Robin Hood of Pirates, but, but he was, you know, came from a very, very lowly uh, working class Devonshire background, the youngest of an entire family, so very, very little opportunity afforded to him 300 years ago. And there is this kind of similarity. The average age of pirates then was about 27. Uh, you've got this backdrop of international interconnected conflict. You've got this establishment that's completely run out of ideas. We're pre-modern democracy and um, pre the, the formation of the empire and this completely unjust and unequal period. And you've got this huge redundancy taking place from the major employers of the time. And frankly, there's just an awful lot of similarities to the landscape as it currently looks. But rather than succumb to the rules and order of the day, which was that, that no challenge was allowed and actually any kind of major challenge could have been imprisoned, Sam speaks out and he speaks out against church, states, government and, and the nascent big business. And, and he challenges those who are succumbing to the laws that rich men make for their own security and asks people, wouldn't they better be off standing up for honesty and speaking their minds? And it's these kind of ideas that took the notion of pirates and, and made it into the brand it was because there was no one speaking on behalf of these people at that moment in time. And this, in my opinion, puts pirates on the, on the, on the, on the history of the, the British working class, post-levelers, post, -levelers, post the, 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 the British Civil War, ahead of movements like the cooperatives that then led to the, the trade union movement, and directly in between it in the fight for equality and workers' rights stand the organization of the golden age pirates and we'll come back to some of the distinct fights that they made but that's truly where they should be and the reason that we're presenting them against the notion of rogues that they're sold to us as but as role models is because of the, the notion and the importance of speaking truth to power a bit like the conversation that's just been asked what's the difference between honesty and arrogance it's a bloody fine line i think you'll find and in this notion you could say that black sam was arrogant but Sometimes you need that, that degree of honesty to speak up to the powers that be. And you don't have to look far to see the kind of leaders that Sam is talking about. And we don't have to look far beyond the kind of limitations that we find ourselves within. The current narrative is obviously dominated by the crisis that we, we find ourselves within and needs no mention. But the truth is, if we're really clear about this, we sit within a crisis, within a crisis, within a crisis, within a crisis. And of course, there's a, there's a fundamental health concern, but then there's also a, a, an equality and social rights emergency as there is a climate emergency sitting around that as there is an erosion of democracy that sits behind that and if we're going to be pirates we cannot let the framing of the challenge be the thing that frames the fight so something begins to become really clear if the only truth that we can look out of, of what's been heralded as the decade of disruption that the 2020s are likely to be and if you think back to like I don't know, 2016, when I began on this, this, this journey, when it really felt like the, the edges of the world were coming apart, in the same way that now kind of looks rosy by comparison to 2020, this year is going to look dull by comparison to the years that are yet to come. Of that, we can be sure. And the only other thing we can really be sure of is you. There is no one else that we can rely on. And that was my 
my biggest mistake or the thing that I, I regret the most, if I, if I could have done, look at what, as we grew up around this, looking for leadership, I kept waiting to be, to be told what to do, to meet the real grown-ups, to, to find out where the strategy was. And it wasn't until I hit 40, it wasn't until I hit all the kind of the trappings and accolades of success to realize that there isn't a plan, that there is no one coming to save us. And why for me, this spirit of, of piracy meant so much, because finally I could see where the responsibility is really going to lie with now and with what comes next. So I was able to then put all of this in, in, into a book, which was kind of a love letter to the, to the agents of change that I could see out there and a reminder to myself, I didn't have any idea what was gonna come next with it. I really thought once I'd written, I was gonna to have to then go and properly uh, get a proper job. And I can then sum the entire book, this notion, this spirit up into one line, which is to say that the biggest mistake I think any of us can make is to believe the way things are is the way they have to be. And that underpins and underlines the reason why we need pirates. Yeah, I think that, that that line is the paradox of piracy that really brings it to life for me because it's both simple and profound at the same time. It is the, the belief simply that we need to stop believing in what is probable and think about what is actually possible. And that's what pirates did. And that is why we need the pirates on board and as Sam has explained they were just these ordinary working class heroes um, people who just looked around at the world and saw this incredible amount of um, wealth that was being hoarded at the top and uh, unfair working practices and lives 40 percent of sailors in the royal navy would die on any voyage so it wasn't exactly like they were lining up to to take that line of employment pirates were simply brave citizens who decided to take a punt and do something different they jumped ship, formed crews of their own. The average age of a pirate was about 28, so they might be considered the, the kind of young millennials of their generation, but we've got to give or take a little bit in terms of life expectancy. And, you know, they would go off and the average size of a crew uh, was about 80. So they didn't really face very good odds um, up against the Navy of several thousand. So pirates had to figure out this new way of living and working together um, with this bunch of strangers out at sea uh, in pretty, still pretty brutal conditions. And so they started to innovate and they started by looking after each other. The first form of social insurance was found on a pirate ship. If you lost a leg or an eye in battle, you would get compensation, like eight pieces of eight or something. Uh, the idea went further into in terms of equality all the way into rights. The pirates up until that point have experienced, and actually it's just been touched on in some of the points in the, in the questions about going against your own community or setting boundaries. So pirates had experienced this brutal one-dimensional didactic command and control leadership. So the creation of equal rights was an act, act of distribution of power, which is what kept their societies true and fair. Indeed. Um, pirates pioneered democracy. I'm just noticing in the chat somebody saying that pirates were traditionally greedy, self-serving opportunists. Not so, as we're going to bust this. Actually, pirates put um, the collective before the individual. They gave everybody an equal say on all the decisions that were made on board a, on board a ship, which is completely different to the kind of command and control structure you would have seen on a navy or a merchant ship where orders came down from the captain. The pirate code was the pirate's blueprint for culture. And every single article in a pirate code was voted upon, voted upon unanimously. It was complete consensus. If even one article, one person didn't like, it didn't go in. So it made sure that everybody, everybody's voice was heard. And it wasn't Maddie about the leftists or, or Sarah about necessarily the old and the young because that equality spans to absolutely everyone. But partly, and, and the challenge, this goes back to something Jeff was saying, you know, how do we stand up to the powers that be, whether it's planning or, or the, you know, the SUV driving? So one aspect of this, when you're absolutely outnumbered and outgunned, was the pirate's storytelling ability. And while some will think it's Coca-Cola who came up with the idea of a modern brand, it was actually the Skull and Crossbones, which was designed deliberately to have this message that someone's touching on, weren't they, these rascally rogues, that took that fear that people had that they were, they were murderous uh, opportunists, but drove their bottom line, drove their ability to protect themselves and made them able to, for 30 years, hold off absolutely inordinate odds. If you think about the combined might of the Royal British Navy, the Spanish Armada, the people that they were up against, this tiny community, about two and a half thousand men and women, at its, at its most, held them off. And it wasn't because of their ability to fight. It wasn't about violence. There are many historians and economists who agree they were some of the least violent people on sea at the time but they knew how to damn well weaponize the story that they had, how to create 
fear. And the fear wasn't just about violence. It was about democracy. It was about organizing. It was about principles. It was about a different generational approach. And to that point, it was about new sets of adults, new rules. That's what truly scared everyone. Yeah, it was, it was things like sharing governance in a way that had never been done before. The idea of a dual house system that we use today uh, to govern parliament, to, sh to kind of keep each other in check and have some real accountability, albeit it doesn't always work that well, was pioneered on pirate ships. Anything to prevent conflict from breaking out so that they could have every chance of surviving at sea. So the captain and the quartermaster were equals. The captain was in charge of the vision and the strategy. And the quartermaster was in charge of the crew, specifically dealing out the punishment and dealing out the money, because those are the two things that were most likely to be corrupted by the captain. Someone's just called out the idea of pirates working often as privateers, and that's certainly true. Um, but the thing to remember there is that the majority of people who were, the majority of employment was on the sea at the time, um, before agriculture really took off. And so under the rules of the time, the, the letter of Mark would allow people to go and fight and maraud and steal from other ships. And that was sanctioned by the, the royals. And then because democracy and diplomacy came along, that was taken away. Now, people who for generations had earned a living in a certain way were then made pirates because the macro rules were taken away from them. So there is an element of interpretation here. Queen Elizabeth was seen as a hero of the, uh, in, in this country for the fights that she fought and won, but she was seen as the pirate queen by absolutely everyone else. Francis Drake is still seen as a national and revered hero, but the rest of the world knew him as El Drake. So there is absolutely a point of interpretation here. But what is not up for interpretation is that being a, a privateer meant that you were told how much money you would earn. If you were on the, 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 the books of the Royal Navy, you may not even get paid. If you were in a pirate organization, you would be equally paid through a transparent model. And someone's already brought this up, probably one of the most remarkable pirate um, things that pirates pioneered well before um, we even started to think about same-sex relationships on an equal stead was that on a pirate ship, same-sex relationships were recognized and through a legal and ritual ceremony that was so sophisticated that it even had an inheritance clause in it. So they were kind of socially and culturally progressive as well as doing it to kind of protect themselves um, and st steal a bit of the money from the establishment, which did, of course, go on. And it goes right through the line. You've got some very modern ideas like halacracy, non-hierarchical non organizations and self and organizing teams. And you can see early elements of this in pirate organizations. But it's really important because, you know, we are both very enthusiastic about these stories, as are the rest of the Be More Pirate community. But I'll pick up on a point that... Uh, Piers Lesser has just made, you know, that still doesn't make stealing okay. And you're absolutely right. Oh, the danger here is through the lens of history, this is moral relativism. Now, it is true that the 18th century was a brutal and tough existence where, you know, public execution was still a form of public entertainment. So, you know, we have to take all of that into account. And it's not to say that pirates were deliberate progressives uh, of their age. They were certainly not designing social insurance so that we might inherit it as an inalienable human right 140 years, 240 years later. Not at all, not at all. But their innovation from being self-serving, from standing up against an unjust and unfair system does have clues and lessons that are particularly relevant right now. Indeed. Um, and I wanna answer the questions as they come up. Um, I would speak to that point as well. Of course, like, Stealing is not the way forward, but if we look to the 18th century and essentially what the establishment was doing was plundering the entire world. So you get into a, an interesting space about what it means to really steal. And yes, pirates did that, but they were, they were following what was considered a norm at the time and then, and then kind of pioneered things on top of that. But the final fun fact about piracy is we'll get into some of the other questions later on about whether you can be a pirate in the public sector. The answer is yes, of course. Pirates even invented cocktails because we're going to here to have a little bit of fun as well. The first record of rum, sugar, mint and water being mixed together in a, a, um, in a lovely concoction was on Francis Drake's ship. Yes, we don't always agree that he was really a pirate or the truest kind of pirate, but it did happen long before um, the old fashioned, which is typically thought of as the world's first cocktail. And the point is really that pirates were not so much the troublemakers that we are made, they made, are made out to be, they were disruptive. Um, they were innovators too. They didn't set out just to, um, to really change the world from any kind of moral perspective. We wouldn't make that argument. 
what they did set out to do was to change their world, to give themselves, piracy was a fight for freedom and to be a little bit less miserable um, because the conditions on Navy ships were so brutal. Were so brutal. Um, and it comes back to that point that Sam made earlier that we are at this point again where we can clearly see that there is a need for new rules and that nobody is going, coming to save the day. What we need is um, some rule breaking. And what we always say to people when we do these sessions is that rule breaking is no longer the risky thing to do. It is in fact the responsible choice. Um, we're at this moment again where we not need to push back against the inherited stuff, the habits and the hangovers that have built up our business models and our institutions and create some new ones. And we won't do that without some rebellion, some bravery. And I always back this point up because I think it sounds like an inspirational kind of me meme. And I first, that's what I first thought when I first started working with Sam, if I'm honest. And as I started to get into this material, I did more research and I came across this term that's always really interested me. And I'm gonna move myself to the side so you can see it. It's called intelligent disobedience. And it's a concept that comes from guide dogs actually. So I wanted to back this up with a bit of science. When you train a guide dog, First of all, you train it to be obedient. You have to, it has to listen to its human. It has to be able to take instructions and to keep the human safe. But crucially, it also has to learn how to be disobedient because otherwise it wouldn't be able to keep the human safe. It has to learn when to listen to its own instincts and recognize that it has a viewpoint that the human can't see. And that notion actually applies to a lot of situations, to our workplaces, especially in high risk environments. If you have got a different point of view and you can see a problem that somebody else can't see, it is your responsibility to raise your voice and challenge, even if that person holds some level of authority and status. But unfortunately, we're not taught that throughout school from the very first moment when your parents said, um, because I said so, as the answer to your question, we have been you know, told to think of people with job titles and certain levels of authority as the only people, as the people with all the answers. Uh, and that's just not the case. But it, mean, it means that the, the real first rebellion, the step before you take a rebellion in the outside world, the inner rebellion is the first and the hardest step. That moment of giving yourself permission, of standing up to yourself. Um, and that's what Pirates gives people. I've noticed through all the stories in our pirate community that pirates gives people permission and we've used it as a proxy word and it's a practice it, it, it's something that you you don't you have to kind of like a, a muscle you have to flex uh, day in day out peeling back the layers of permission that have built up over time and we always ask this question when we're doing workshops we're not going to stop because we've got you know loads to get through um, but I would like to pose it as a question to the group um, you can put some answers into the chat this is the next challenge um, what is the permission you're not giving yourself? What are you letting get in your way? And I'm gonna put that out there for 30 seconds. And see if anyone's got any immediate thoughts. But there's some great other quotes coming through, which I'm loving. Planning, comfort, yes. Hmm. Confidence, security, convention, not having the right words. COVID, for sure. <laughs> Judgment. These are all brilliant ideas and we can, we'll return to them. I'm glad I likes the dog as well. <laughs> I will say that every time we ask this question, there is pretty much, I mean, by and large, sometimes we'll get hangover as a, as a good sort of challenge. Um, it almost always falls into the categories of either fear or admin. Either we are overwhelmed in some respect from all the kind of clutter that's going on in our lives and the busyness and the tiredness that that creates, or it's some manifestation of fear in some shape or form. Yeah, got some great answers. <laughs> Carrot cake. Stuff and things, admin for sure. Fear of offending, judgment, yeah.
but there is a necessity to challenge the fear and the admin that gets in your way. And this is where Sam's going to take us into his own rebellion. And I am absolutely loving uh, the chat. There is something also to Rebecca and Owen and, and the rest of the team. There's something obviously that you just got right. Um, and when we were talking, actually, we'd first we talked about me doing a slightly different talk. And, and we decided in that that actually pirates was the thing we needed to talk about. And I decided to, to, to share that and bring Alex with us. And I'm so glad to have done this. I'm going to just divert for a second. Sorry, Alex. But it seems that we're doing all right for time because so much of the questions that have been asked are spot on to what this is all about and to the bit that drives both Alex and I, which is really about the kind of right and wrong. There's some, some points that have been made about legality from planning to this, that and the other. And really, it's a question of morality. And I think that we are we're off the edge of the map currently in terms of anybody knowing what to do with the current crisis. Yet we know for a fact that the, the crisis we face was absolutely predicted. The 2017 risk register for the United Kingdom said the number one risk the UK faces economically and socially is a global pandemic. And lo and behold, uh, three years later, that's what happens. So the word unprecedented, which is gonna be the word of the year is not necessarily true. Unprepared for would be more accurate. So this is where we have to really get clear about this. And it's not about some of the minutiae of the right and wrong. Actually, we have to elevate it above that. And the, our call to questioning and challenging rules isn't necessary to pick apart the bureaucracy or the administration of them. The opportunity for pirates is to step outside of it altogether. It wasn't just about rejecting the rules of society that, that makes the story of pirates interesting. It's the rewriting the rules of society that makes it interesting. And that is very, very real for me. You know, this wasn't, uh, you know, a book to eulogize. And, and I feel the same, like, as Alex said, you know, some of the quotes when they're taken out of context and I see them being back used by the people can feel a bit, you know, aphorism, but in its deepest sense. And for the deep, the deepest possible sense for me, it brings it completely home is to my daughter. So I've got two amazing daughters. Um, the world that they're gonna grow up in means oh so much to me. And I'm so clearly aware of the opportunities that that world has to be the most challenging environment it ever could be, or that this moment in time, if we truly step into the opportunity that's been afforded to us in this huge period of uncertainty equals change, a very different one for them. But as a person who experiences the very difficult paradox between pirate and parent, when an eight-year-old is asking me or, or telling me that they've just gone and broken the rules, then we find ourselves in a really difficult situation. So it's not about legality. It's not about the technicality. It's about a new morality and having a sense of order as to where you stand. And I've told this story. Uh, I learned this story the hard way. And I tell it in the beginning of the new book, but it just bears mentioning based on the conversation that I've seen go into that spot. Because when I had to try and explain this to a, to a child, to whom I think it means so much, yet actually it's so imperative to, to understand and know the rules if you're gonna break them. There's no good just complaining from the sidelines. That is not what this book is about. And the, the inspiration that I draw from the work that Alex has done and from the community of pirates themselves is that there is demonstration here of action. And that's truly the failing of the first book, my failing, is that it was great on the inspiration part of it, but it let, its, it let itself down towards the end. And that's what's so incredible about the work that comes on the back of it. And the question to all of you, I'm not calling anyone a negative ninny, um, but you know, as is being pointed out, sometimes where the debate can go, the question to all of us, what this rule breaking comes down to is when in our lives, are we willing to do the wrong thing when we know it's the right thing to do? That's what this really comes down to. And for me, this became really clear at the, at the outset of the book. I already mentioned that it was a deeply turbulent and difficult uh, moment in my life. Um, all sorts of challenges were, were upon me uh, and the need for growing up and getting a real job was fucking profound, right? I'd gone through a, 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 a divorce, albeit an amicable one, nonetheless traumatic. Um, the costs are, of, of my new life are huge. And, and I'd just written this book and I knew the power that was in it. I'd been workshopping it relentlessly um, from Bradford to Brixton to Baltimore to, to, to Athens with people who really represent change. And it was my love letter to them, yet at the same time, the moment I was in didn't really give me much license to carry on taking many risks. But I found myself massively proud to be published by Penguin. And I found myself here in their head offices in the middle of London in this meeting room here. 
And this looks onto the, the one of the busiest uh, roads in London as there's six lanes of arterial traffic going down right into the center of town. And I asked, having been told that there was gonna be zero budget for this book, if I could possibly fly poster this window. It's the size of a route master bus. And my background's in nightclubs and raves. And I thought, well, this is gonna be my opportunity to make an impact and to, to fly the flag of piracy. And of course I was told absolutely no. I was chased from the building, in fact, by the, uh, the building manager, a very nice man called Trevor. And then the opportunity was afforded to me to take the exact advice that we were supposing to everybody else. I got a call from the chief executive of my publisher, a lovely man called Tom Weldon, who asked my opinion about looking as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur, becoming an author, what would I challenge in the building? And I said so much, you know, the, the diversity of this place, their approach to creativity, the flaws that I could see in publishing. He asked me if I'd go in and do a talk on the matter. I said, yeah, of course. But having just had the quote back from making this insanely huge poster that I wanted to fly post to the front of their office, I realized I couldn't afford it. So I asked the chief exec of my publisher for the money to vandalize his own building. Of course, I didn't tell him what it was for, but he agreed. And then I downloaded a Penguin logo off Google. I forged a letter that gave me approval that I didn't have. I've made up Tom Weldon's signature at the bottom of it. And I ordered a couple of high-vis vests off the internet. And on the morning that the book was out at 7 a.m. on a bright sunny day, I went up and I fly posted the front of their building the size of a bloody London double-decker bus. And I ran away. I took some pictures, I made a video and I got back to our offices and I had that fear, that deep fear of like, you know the risk that you've taken. This was a calculated risk, but it absolutely has to work. And to one of the earlier questions about honesty and arrogance, the old opportunity there is also just to be a dick. And that's what I felt like because it just didn't take off. There wasn't any media coverage. There wasn't, it didn't get picked up on social media. The only pickup I was getting was phone calls from Penguin telling me that I'd taken it too far and taken the mickey and I was gonna be the first author to lose their book deal on the day of publication. I was terrified and I had a real dilemma. I wanted to run away and hide. I realized that I overstepped the mark and I just felt like an idiot. Or was I gonna try and make it work? And I decided to stick it out. And I picked up the phone and in the kind of, the, what felt to me at the moment, like the jewels of how I'd taken this huge risk and I, everything was riding on it. And I got on the phone and I absolutely founded everybody I possibly could to get behind this thing. And one of the people that I'd spoken to in the process worked at Virgin. I called her and I asked if there was any way she could help me with this. And she managed to get the images in front of Richard Branson, who at 4 p.m. that afternoon tweeted it. And I'm not necessarily Branson's biggest fan, but by God, I fucking thank him for this moment because it changed everything. 17 million people, it begins to circulate. All of a sudden, the book's in the top 1,000. All of a sudden, it's in the top 500. All of a sudden, we find our book in the top 100 books. And all of a sudden, something begins to take off. Over the next three months, I tried to put myself into different levels of, of risk that speak to the, the privileges and powers that are afforded to me. In fact, Polly has just pointed up you know, it's very, very clear uh, that, that this is a subjective opportunity for me. And maybe the risk to me on this one was minimal. Um, with some of the other things that I did, perhaps it was more so. With many of them, did I look different? Was I of a different background or a different color? Would I have got away with it? And arguably not. But I had to lean in and all of us have to lean into the amount of privilege, power and perspective we've got, because therein we find the levers of change that we can. And it comes and goes in many different ways. When the book was out in the States, I had no physical opportunity to go there and do the same kind of thing. But I worked with the, 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 the publishers that I had to try and find, you know, what are the kind of influencers or, or celebrities that I could possibly find? And I discovered that the most influential book reading celebs out in America were possibly the people I suspect the least. And I tried to get in touch with them, tried to invite them to join our, our world of piracy and simply got nothing back. So I found a different road and questioned to myself, well, maybe. I could just Photoshop them in. And I began to really take the mickey. I thought hopefully in a kind of humorous way that they might enjoy if they were to get the joke. And it was meant to be a joke because we're in the age of fake news. So you had to tread carefully here. And I traded very bit too far because I found myself in a great deal of, of trouble with my publishers. And having been given a great big warning sign from them, I felt there was only one way to go if we were really going to push it as far as I could. So I managed to find a, a, a video of Oprah telling us about the best book of 2018. And it felt like she was describing mine. It was a book about revolution and change and knowing what you're going to stand up for so with a little bit of motion graphics i was able to put my cover onto her cover and at this point i realized i had gone too far and was threatened with all of it being taken away from me and yeah there was a bigger implication to that absolutely in both my personal and professional lives the question was put to me by my, both publishers stand down man are you here to sell some books grow up or are you here to start your own movement is this about you is this about your ego and it was a great question it absolutely settled me and I absolutely was clear that I wasn't here just to sell some books. 
I wasn't here just to buy into publishing or become another product. I wasn't here to, to take the ideas that had been formed from so many others. You know, I owe everything to the young people that I'd worked with through Liberty and the spirit of rebellion that came from them. As, as this movement does now from the brave pirates who step into the space and have given us inspiration for the second book. And so there's no way I was just about to let this become a series of marketing stunts and do whatever you could to try and fucking flog a book. So no, it absolutely had to become about the movement. As I, as I looked to that and tried to understand the truth of that, the movement began to speak back to me. And I started to get emails, DMs, letters from people who'd started reading the book. And, and I can tell you for a man who was already on the edge of anxiety, it sent me over the edge. This note, you probably can't read it in detail, is, a, is an individual telling me that they'd read the book and it had led to them changing their life, that they'd left their job. I started to get people attaching resignation letters and sending them to me. The feeling of that on the back of something that I'd made up, you know, I'd done as much diligence and, and, and homework as I could, but I'm, I'm, I'm not an academic, I'm a dyslexic, right? So my, my belief in myself having written the book was terrifying. It was compounded because actually a real pirate got in touch with me at this point, telling me, you know, to, to be very careful as I told true stories of pirates. He's on the call with us now. You know, there was messages coming left, right and center. And I questioned absolutely everything. And it wasn't just, you know, well thought through resignation letters. It wasn't pirates telling me that I needed to, to be careful with my messaging. It was crazy people taking violent campaigns to the streets and attacking the gambling industry. You know, people really ripping up rules that need challenging. And if you can see what Stephen's challenging here, the fixed odds betting terminal scam is a scam and needs challenging. And here we are suddenly with an inbox into the thousands that I couldn't live up to. I didn't have the strength of character or at the time the confidence. I had, a, I had an absolute confidence crisis, if I'm totally honest, to step into this space that I'd invited others to do so. And I was called out, bullshit was called on me by the community. You know, people signed up to the, to the movement and all they got was like a trite newsletter from me. And I realized I was going to miss the moment and miss the opportunity to start a movement. And here you've got messages like, like this guy, finish the book, tomorrow's day one, people setting out to change their lives. And here am I feeling like a scoundrel and an imposter in the middle of it all. And I don't know where it would have gone from that had I not met Alex. And she'd come aboard, firstly, yes, as my right-hand pirate, but now where she rightly stands as the head of our growing community. So the next question we'd leave with you to consider, and hopefully we'll have time to come back for, or maybe let's take 60 seconds here, feels like a really important one. We sometimes uh, you know, talk about the kind of a metric of success in all of this piracy, but it comes down to it really often. What, and actually it was asked in the points earlier on, what are you willing to sacrifice for what we think is right? The question being asked of me, you know, the, with this example, the only person I was putting really at risk is myself. Yes, absolutely. But that's the position we find ourselves in, right? So what is it of us? You know, here is a bunch of people not afraid to, to ask amidst a festival that's talking about real change. Earlier on, the question was asked, you know, what are we willing to, uh, you know, where does Rich check? What are we going to have to let go of? Does this really count up to anything? And yet it's only going to do that if we're willing to lose something, to sacrifice something. Yes. And um, this is where we're going to get into the how-to part of this, because I think, you know, for all that really um, inspirational and heartfelt um, uh, kind of talk that Sam has, and I had been to see him talk quite a few times by the time we were, we were really getting into this and working together, um, I could see the energy and the momentum and, and started to work with him. I could also see the authenticity, even if that came about, you know, through fear of feeling like I can't live up to this movement, which is a different kind of leadership to anything I'd previously experienced. Here was someone who was willing to be so open and so honest with me. Um, so, but, I, but it, having said that, I, I was still, you know, harboring some, some skepti skepticism. And what I really wanted to find out from all those messages of pe that people were sending them was, well, what were they really taking from this? Like, if this is going to be a movement, I don't want it to be a, a sort of superficial idea. I don't want it to just feel like a newsletter. I don't want it to just feel like memes or, in, or a really, really nice Instagram account, which, you know, he really started and looked good. Um, and I've probably not done as much, but, um, you know, I wanted to focus on the people, the relationships that we were building and what they were really doing and how it was helping them. And from that, that's where the new book came from, this idea of the how-to. So I'm just gonna share some of the stages of what I think it really means uh, to be a pirate and how you can actually do it. And from all, you know, from every 
part of the spectrum from the person who you know you've never felt like you want to break a rule or you feel as though you're in a an environment where you can't all the way up to people with super big ambitions um and the interesting thing is it starts from that question like what will you stand up and fight for um sam had put rebellion right at the beginning of be more pirate and he put the pirate code right at the end as it was like the kind of end result but actually what i found is that the pirate code this idea of your values and the principles that you really care about like what matters to you and why you're getting out of bed in the morning and what you're going to fight for is the foundation of any kind of rebellion it's actually much more important than any kind of rebellion or violence and i saw a few comments about that like it's not that it, it's about it's actually about a new morality uh, first and foremost and one of the most incredible stories that came for first um, that I explored was from an organization called Tradecraft who are original pioneers of fair trade in the UK in the 1980s they built, you know brought in the first fair trade sugar tea coffee um, and ended up helping to co-found the fair trade foundation and the fair trade mark but over time, as often happens with pirates, you start at the edges of the map in the margins and you drift into the mainstream as the ideas that you are pioneering become more acceptable. So as they were starting to do this, um, fair tra uh, Tradecraft as a smallish organization started to feel um, that they were losing their mission, their sense of purpose and their mission, that radical and like urgency they had um, as it got adopted, like fell away. Um, and they reached a real crisis point in 2018. The CEO had to turn around to the team and say, you know what, we might actually have to stop trading. Um, our business model has become unsustainable. We're not turning over enough profit. Uh, even though we believe in what we do, um, we don't know if it's gonna work. It's just by coincidence that one of the, uh, the other team, one of the team that they had, had picked up Be More Pirate at the same time as one of the board members had given it to the CEO. And they decided that it in fact was worth fighting for. And they'd use this idea of piracy as a blueprint to get them back. But it was really the spirit of it, the, the sense of reclaiming their story. Uh, and what it led to was a kind of renewed mission and a new kind of mission to democ democratize and make supply chains more transparent in the light of climate change, um, where we quite possibly face a scenario where supermarkets are going to go bare in the next 20 years if we don't change the way that we organize our supply chains their mission is to first get really transparent about that. And their first rebellion was to create a transparency coffee, which might seem like a small thing, but was like a real kind of weaponizing of their new story. So they have created this special edition transparency coffee that breaks down the supply chain on the front of the packet um, as a way to kind of tell the world what their new mission was about. One of the most fascinating and in-depth pirate codes we got was from an organization called the Child's Rights International Network. That was the moment when Sam actually started to take this whole thing seriously, because I said, you know, a human rights NGO is creating a pirate code. They think that's what we need. We need to simplify our values, get really clear on them, um, and use that as the basis, not a business plan, not a strategy document. Um, just be clear about what we stand for. And they wanted to set a whole new standard for NGOs, like stop funding yourselves into existence um, but actually, you know, and, and peddling narratives of misery that just to keep that funding in a cycle and going, they wanted to actually define more clearly what they were going to fight for. And that led them to the edges of the map. Um, CRIN, as I call them, the Child's Rights International Network, because it's a bloody mouthful, um, started to campaign on really, really like fringe issues, things like the forced against the forced sterilization of children with learning disabilities, like children's rights issues that would, no one would touch. Um, that became their new mission and as a result their funders actually liked them more they didn't sort of like run away in fear of this new radical mission um, they actually got um, kind of renewed momentum from the funding um, bodies that they were using and this is a really important point about how to be more pirate it's when you get clear on what really matters you also get clear on what doesn't matter and so what happened with Crin was that some of the team actually volunteered to leave um, rather than go through some really awkward redundancy process they said you know what the work that I'm doing it's not that important compared to these bigger picture ideas and ambitions we've got so we're going to leave and they were able to let go of so much work it's a really fundamental prepar preparative step towards being more pirate is letting go and that's also what the team at Birdseye did when we Sam did some workshops with Birdseye um, to try and reclaim their entrepreneurial spirit 
and really, you know, tackle some big stuff around climate change. And like the whole team was concerned about um, pl ocean plastic and what could they do about it. But they were so overwhelmed by their own um, schedules, their inboxes, their, like, all the process and the meetings. They had to clear the decks first. So they kind of created a few really quick down and dirty new rules like meeting free Mondays, a one in one out rule to drop new work when it comes on your desk. So you don't let your to do this grow exponentially. A be here now rule. So no one's allowed to have mobile phones in meetings and there's no multitasking going on. It's like simplify and get clear and then we can get to the really, really big stuff. This is what we call small bold actions. This is the antidote to boring strategy documents, which I have seen about a million. It's about figuring out something you could do in the next couple of weeks that will cut through the stagnation, something that is simple, not logistically complex, so you can get going. It might just be sending an email to somebody, putting your hand up in the meeting. Um, it's gotta be bold, um, but it's also a really important point about it. What we've noticed is if you can get it to be repeatable, so it compounds and the behavior compounds, that's when you're really, really onto something. Um, one of the kind of small bold actions that comes up the most when we start doing these workshops and things is to try and at least schedule in what we call a fuck shut up meeting, which is a, a some time in the protected time in the diary to just start to think about your rebellion. And believe it or not, this might sound so tame to some people, but in a corporate environment, that is your starting point. Like get set that time in the diary to start thinking about throwing out some wild card ideas, think about the what ifs, um, and then you'll be on your way. Or if you're feeling a little bit more rebellious, um, another small bold action that I love sharing is a guy called Matthew Cook, who, um, well, we can see you and not me, Sam. I don't know. Um, I'll mute myself, dude. Oh, okay. Can everyone see me? I hope you can. Um, this is Matthew Cook, anyway. He is a, one of our uh, pirates who came, started right at the beginning of the whole movement, who ha holds up these signs on the tube, which you probably can't read, but it says, the world is a better place with you in it. And he goes there to kind of like tackle loneliness at source. He's an HR manager who's concerned about loneliness and said, rather than just writing a report about it, I'm gonna go onto the tube, uh, the London Underground of all places, and just start making eye contact with people and see what happens. And he said, the first time I did it, it was the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. But now I've done it more and more, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done too. Um, and people have started to join me. Other people have started to want to join my campaign. So it's like hitting that sweet spot where fear meets excitement, where like, if you, you know, you might be terrified of doing it, but if you did it, something amazing could happen. And then once you start with small bold actions, you kind of like flex the muscle of rule breaking. It leads you off the edges of the map. We've referred to this a few times tonight, but that is really where the real treasure lies, off the edges, in the darkness, when other people are afraid of going. So getting those uncomfortable questions and actually digging into them. Why don't we talk about money? Did anyone do some do anything about Black Lives Matter? You know, did you take it up or did you just kind of let the moment go? All those kind of uncomfortable things you've got to put on the on the table and really start to go there and one amazing charity that i worked with last year and we have become on board of the pirate crew um perhaps unusual pirates i don't know um is macmillan the cancer charity who decided last year that they needed to tackle some of their taboos and get a little bit more pirate and start to rewrite some rules they're quite a traditional charity um with a big membership base but they'd also done this really quite pirate thing of forming a cancer community in London. So to try and understand like all the different experiences of cancer in London, like they, you know, from the Chinese community to the young person's experience of cancer. And what they found is one woman came forward and she said, you know what the one taboo subject that we don't talk about is sex, sex after cancer. Um, we talk about fertility, but we don't talk about sex in the pleasure sense. And I need to, and she says, no nurse will talk to me about this. So I want to bring it up. And so they started to host sex and cancer workshops in se inside sex shops. They partnered with a, a sex shop in East London uh, and kind of got that conversation going. And it was so freeing and moving to the people who attended. It was like a um, just an ability to talk about this totally close up subject that they couldn't often talk to their partners or their families about. So this is Macmillan really kind of pushing their boundaries, overcoming the internal resistance to go there and um, tackling a slightly taboo issue. And they're not the only pirates in health and social care. I wanna pick back up on that topic. 
as we as I close this up. I think it was always a surprise to Sam that the um, sector that has taken most to piracy has been um, health and social care. Perhaps because, I don't know, Sam, you imagined that this was written with the kind of young entrepreneurial marketing crew that you knew in mind. Um, yet, and, and someone did say earlier, the NHS was a private idea to begin with. It wasn't a totally new thing, but over time, of course, um, as things become institutionalized and, and, and a mainstream thing, um, they risk you know, all the bureaucracy and kind of hierarchical, um, all the hierarchy kicks in and our pirates within health and social care, you know, have kind of kicked back and said, this system is sacred. We've got to protect it. It needs to not become an efficiency echo chamber about all about productivity. People are the heart of, and soul of this and we need to put people over process. We've got to rehumanize the system. This is their rallying cry. And it started largely in Greater Manchester um, with a kind of crew of people forming, challenging rules around how we recruit people so we get a more holistic kind of recruitment, challenging, um, you know, how we can rehumanize hospital waiting areas with some small interventions rather than writing a whole toolkit. Let's get some chairs in a room and start finding ways to create the connections again where it's being lost. And the most important part of it is, is that is that crew. And I would be remiss to um, mention some probably some of our other pirates, but I'm going to stop there because I've talked quite a long time. Um, what we've come to describe all of this brilliant stuff as is professional rule breaking, which is a little bit of a double entendre, which is um, rule breaking in a professional setting, which is by and large where we seem to need piracy an unpicking of the system through small and large rule breaks day to day. We sit on so many levers of power in the roles that we have um, that we can really lean on those a lot more. But also professional rule breaking, just getting good at it, <laughs> becoming a professional. Um, and there are a couple of measures of success in this that we say work. Um, if you wanna see how you're doing over time with this idea, Sam, you're mute. Yeah, I muted myself to stop distracting the screen. And this speaks to, I think, some of the good points in the in in the chat. Some of the excellent questions in the chat, I would say. When asked, you know, if there should be some measure, you know, everyone got their opinion of, of success, and, and we are not an organisation. We've tried to keep this as light and as and as pirate-like as possible, um, in the way that we share power between us, decision making and and control. Uh, Alex is, you know, taking control because far better than I will. She's letting this community of pirates determine where this goes. Um, I'm much more used to thinking I know best and, and wanting to challenge it and, and we'll go in this direction. And so being questioned, you know, what's the metric of success? As soon as something becomes something, you know, it takes on all these kind of measures and, and identities. And that's one of the things we've tried hard to resist. So it began as a bit of a, a quick line that, uh, you know, well, what does it look like? And this became the answer, nearly getting fired once a year. And it speaks to some of the challenges that were made because this is relative. You know, we're not the ones laying down what it necessarily means for everybody to be a pirate. Yeah, there's a thought process that runs through the book. And more importantly, and interestingly than the framework I came up with is the consistency of what the, the, the pirates in the new book have undertaken, because there is a way to challenge the system. There is a way to rewrite the rules. And time and again, this, this avatar donning the cape of piracy and giving yourself permission to go and challenge things, not just to criticize, but to go and create change, there becomes a metric of success. And there is a, 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 an acceptance and a willingness that it's gonna be difficult, that it's gonna be uncomfortable, that it's gonna to lead to some kind of trouble. Now, that's why this turns out to be a question of morality. Because if I'm nearly going to get fired once a year, then it better bloody well be worth it. And then you will walk into the, the, the point that we made earlier on that was challenged you know, about morality, which brings this down to an individual setting. What is the right and wrong thing to do? As I discussed it with my daughter, are you doing the wrong thing and knowing damn well that it's going to be the right thing for you? There's never been any kind of great change that took place in human progress when there hasn't been a difference of opinion around that. And so if you're going to determine the future, if you're going to break the rules that currently exist within the world you're in, you have to have a view as to what comes next. And so decision-making based on values becomes the most important thing. 
when we're off the edges of the map, there has to be a compass and that compass has got to be based on, on belief. So yeah, the, the, the new question around the greater good, absolutely, we believe that. We're asked again and again, you know, isn't Donald Trump a pirate? Isn't ISIS a pirate? And our answer is, yeah, that's, that's not even the question. No, and obviously Donald Trump's a dickhead. Um, there's a much more important part of it. And the next parts of the framework that we talk about are the, the writing of new rules, the creative acts, the sharing of power, the collaboration that needs to take place. None of this works without a crew. And the true success of the pirates, the tenure that they had was because they collaborated so well. You see these pirate codes that were created at the time, they, there was no way of them being written down. That was a death sentence, but they were memorized over time. And you see again and again, these principles of fairness, of sharing power and of equality, ideas that you could be imprisoned for or executed for at the time. And they remain consistent. You find the few bits of pirate code over this lifetime. And, and where are those now? And that's why this is important. Where are the big ideas that are equal to the size and scale of the challenges we face that we would fight for, that we're not divide, divided by the identity politics of it, important as that is, but the great big unifying ideas that we are together behind, that do unite us, that we will fight for and that we'd sacrifice for. That's what is exciting to me about this profound moment in time, this missing history lesson and why I'm willing to stand up behind things and, and possibly lose the contract or, or get challenged or get in trouble for it to put my neck on the line because I see it being met. I see it being responded to. And that's the other part of it. The other metric of success we've got, the only other one we look to is ideas that other will then begin to follow. You know, is there some validity in this? And this is what makes the, the most surprising word about the whole pirate movement once I looked at it was that they were accountable. And there is an accountability that comes when you start determining your own set of rules, because it's not for you to complain about the way things are done. It's the risk that I've taken from setting out my own plans or changing a new and different way of doing it is now I'm going to be the one that gets in trouble. But if, and as we see it again and again with the history of social movements in every single sense, it's when there begins to be critical mass behind a new idea. And that's the true of politics and the politicians that we've inherited. And we may not like them, we may not think they're doing the best job, but public policy changes when public opinion changes. And when you can demonstrate that, and when you get behind that, then we see politics and everything else move. And of course, some people cannot get, afford to get fired. In the moment that I was in, I could not afford to either. And like I say, it's relative. It's relative to you as an individual, what's right and wrong for you. And of course, one size does not fit all, and that's part of what's so beautiful about the piracy uh, and the moment of it. Um, and of course, it's not, you know, there's, not a, there's not a statistic for a tipping point. That's what's beautiful about public opinion. That's what's beautiful about ideas. And as um, that quote goes, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And that's the moment, the space that we find ourselves in. And that's why this notion of what are the rules we're gonna break and challenge come from? Someone asked about diversity of the, the pirate crew. Are there any people of color in this organization? Well, A, there isn't an organization, there's just Alex and I. And certainly within our community, yes, of course there is. And certainly within the original pirate community, um, they were pioneers in this space. They were regularly releasing and freeing slaves and, and inviting them into their community with equal say, equal pay, equal equality. And you'll find amazing, incredible stories, not just of female pirates, but of black pirates too. And, and again, the, the challenge that that represents to the times that they were in, you know, the power and the threat of, of released slaves, now pirates bearing down on, on, on their victims, imagine. So yes, the icon of it, the story of it is, is pulling strands on all of these things. And that's why the challenge at the end of the book and the challenge at the core of the community is what's gonna be the rule that you break relative to your power, to your privilege and to your predicament currently and to your position. And in that rule, is there an idea for a new rule that others will get behind? that things can change on the back of, that we will stick together as we form around this idea and grow a level of public opinion that hits towards a tipping point that begins to lead to change because it's the only place that change is ever gonna come from and it's the only, change, the only place that change, the change that we need is gonna come from. But whilst big ideas are what's needed because the challenges we have are big, the how, what we've seen again and again in every conversation is not someone who can get up on stage and get everyone excited, it's the discipline. It's the detail and it's the daily steps that are taken. And this wouldn't have been in, in my original ethos or idea. You know, I get too hung up on the big ideas. But in all of the studies that Alex led, whether it's the NHS or it's, it's been in charity, whether it's been in big business or it's been startups and local community work, it's taking apart the big idea and then deconstructing it into brave, 
daily steps and stages that can be undertaken. And when we see real change take place, change that hasn't been dictated from above, change that hasn't been lost in an email thread or, or, or suffocated in a PowerPoint document or destroyed in, a, in an argument about you know, the, the smaller end of politics, the things that make a difference is a small group of people with a big idea and very clear steps that they're accountable to on a daily basis. And then change happens and has happened again and again over the last two years. And that will sit at the core of the movement that's to come. Because so I masked it again and again. What's the rule that I'm then going to break? And the rule that I had to break was, was my own. I'm so excited by this. You know, at that exact moment, the risk that I took has turned into not just a, a, a movement, but a career completely redefined me and who I am. I was absolutely defined by liberty in the work that I'd done before. I expected this to be a, a small adventure in, in writing a book, proving a point. There is no way on earth I expected to be here. And just at that exact moment, I could begin to feel the trappings of me projecting my ego, my ideas, where does this go next? I wasn't as connected to the community. And so it became really clear as I saw the first draft that Alex had pulled together. And as we were coming towards the publication date, as I'd, I'd finally been... Uh, made officially a pirate by Captain Tons here that the best thing I could do, the best rule I could break would be the one against my own limitations and expectations. And so three weeks ago when the book came out, Alex, once the right-hand pirate, became the captain of this entire movement and she announced to the, to the team, to the crew, not only what's outlined in the book, but where this thing is going to go next. And that's part of the invitation she's going to make now. Thank you, Sam. Um... Yeah, just to sort of wrap that up, because I'd really love to um, have some more some chat if we've got some time and hear some of your thoughts. There's been some brilliant comments in the chat. But before we do, you know, if anyone would like to um, join our crew or would like to find out more, um, this is my email address. Um, you can also sign up on our website for quite infrequent newsletters. Um, but if you do send me an email, I will send you back the first um, chapters of Be More Pirate and um, send some more info about some things that are coming up in the next few weeks. Because we do, I do host regular kind of meetups, regular-ish meetups for um, people to come together and sort of share ideas. And I, I just say that I really like the challenge of so much of what you've said tonight from what I can see in the chat. I'm really trying to hold spaces to ask the difficult questions, to be challenged back about all of this stuff, these, these ideas about piracy and what it means and what kind of rules we should break and rewrite and where the values sit and how we can close the gap between intention and action um, and actually and, and get it moving. So thank you very much for your time. Okay. <laughs> Back to the chat and the questions. If we've still got time, Rebecca and Owen. Yeah, I was going to say, did, did, what, what are we going to chat about? <laughs> Well, I'd like to open it up to the floor and if anyone's got anything that they'd like to raise or a comment or a question, um, if you use the hand raise button in the reactions bit at the bottom, that's probably the easiest way to see um, what. Particularly if anyone felt that they you know, we tried to, we were surprised by how good the difficult questions were. So I'm just kind of scrolling back, but if anyone had really, you know, quest difficult questions they didn't feel answered, like put your hand up and let's hear you. Kenny Lee's got a good one. Yeah. Do you want to get over it? Mm -hmm. Jeff's got his hand up. Okay, over to Jeff. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Um, I put a couple of things up. Uh, one is about um, how the old and the affluent steal from the young and the poor via the planning system. 500 quid's worth of agricultural land becomes worth about 200 grand in York if you give it planning permission. And uh, that goes to the landowner and keeps house prices high, which benefits homeowners and landowners to the detriment of those that rent. Uh, Climate change is one of the other things. We don't seem to be telling people what their carbon footprints are, and they seem to be enormous. And all the all, all the planning that goes on uh, is planning for people with ten plus 
tons a year carbon footprints, which is a climate disaster. Mm. So are these the sort of, um, and no one, no one wants to listen. No one, no one, no one, mm. no one knows about these things much, particularly the planning thing. They, you, the, the young ought to be angry, but why aren't you? So I can I can I can make a bit of a response to that, Jeff. Um, and they're really good points, and they're absolutely true. And we see them all over the the, the country, and we've seen them for a long while. You know, the the entire model uh, is based on a degree of exploitation, right? Whether it's the exploitation of the young and exploitation of the land. Having worked so closely with young people for such a long time, I've heard them asked again and again by generations older than them, why aren't they angry? Why aren't they out and why aren't they protesting? And the number one response I've heard back from those young people is that simply they don't think it's going to work. And it wasn't until Extinction Rebellion came along that I saw it really in any way, but maybe the student protest, mass mobilization of young people because it just didn't feel like it was going to work. So until the notion of civil disobedience was added into it, it just didn't have the teeth. So where were they to, to place that misplaced anger? And yes, you can talk about land or you can talk about education, you can talk about home ownership, uh, you can talk about the destruction of the environment. So many different places those young people feel that the future has been lost to them. And there's, there's very rarely is there a time where we really teach the skills of attacking it. What I would suggest is that going against the planning system, using the tools of the planning system is, is rarely going to work. So there's other ways and, and means around it, you know, from the, from the guerrilla gardening moment, the movement that I know has been part of this this festival to you know some of the interesting young people I know who are using the gorilla, the gorilla gardening movement won't make uh, start homes for twenty thousand pounds though, which is quite possible if you take all the planning gain out of it and get one of these cheap starter homes from Poland. Uh, and yeah, I, saw, I saw that I saw that link and I liked it very much and it'd be very interesting to see what happens when you know you combine that with squatters' rights. So. I, um, it's going to be those kind of those kind of strong pushbacks, and I and I, I see the beginning of it in things like you know the the guerrilla gardening. I see the things of it in the mutual aid movement. I see the the replacement of the democratic model that is failing us so badly, whether it be on a local civic scale or on a national scale, not being in updating the the system that we've got. I think it's failed as an institution as a way of decision making. And I think there are there are platforms that are still nascent and naive, and so they don't feel like they can replace it yet. But that is what we need to look to as the the, the beginning of roots of new ways of organizing ourselves from a civil point of view, from a local regional point of view. And, and unless we start trying those out, and they'll feel like absolute mutiny to begin with, we're not going to get close to what the models of the new institutions are going to be. But propping up the failing ones, just complaining about the way they don't work, I simply don't see that as an option anymore. I think there's lots of answers to your question, Jeff. Um, and I do bring it back down to this idea of where we get our individual courage and ability to speak up from. And you say, why aren't they angry? Why aren't they protesting? Probably, yeah, because they don't believe anything can change. Um, but also just because we're not, we're not really conditioned or programmed to, to challenge like by default, coupled with, I think, the distraction of the 21st century um, where you know we're, we're, we are, um, we have corporations and companies who are literally buying our attention day day by day, um, and kind of letting it happen. So I think anything you know, this when I talk about the small rule breaks, I think that it comes down to those those small acts that you start with, whether it's removing things or figuring out what you could challenge that wouldn't get you into, wouldn't feel too much of a personal risk, and you start to build it up from there. And they seem like such small things when you think about. The whole, the whole of what needs to happen and how fast it needs to happen. Um, but from there, you know, quite amazing things could happen. Like if you think about the small bold action of Greta Thunberg, kind of, which is a small bold action of repeatable thing, just don't go to school. It started, you know, a whole movement. And also I think you, you raised a really good point, Jeff, about visibility and people don't know this stuff. So there's a real kind of need for a solution about visibility for some of the facts out there that will make people stand up and take notice and also the solutions that do exist. And I just wanna say like a shout out as well to like um, to Dina, who's probably still on the call, I hope, who is, you know, educating communities. Hi Dina, about how you can set up a community benefit society, which is a kind of cooperative style organization that allows people to take control of their local communities and assets. So the community can make the decisions about the resources that we have 
So there are solutions that can be can that are, that exist, and I think the part of the problem is that people don't know about them or don't know how to start them, and you know we get distracted by the need to kind of keep our own lives going. So if you can create a little bit of space for that learning, um, and find the people who are doing that, and you know I said you know Dina's and the CBSs are brilliant. Um, she's doing that in Colville in the um, East Midlands. But also there's a big kind of campaign around like flat pack democracy, which is to take over local councils, which is the same point, which is how can we own our local assets more easily so that those kind of decisions that you're talking about around planning don't get bloody made by people with all their interest in profit. And um, they're made by pe local people who have an interest in the community. I'll stop there. <laughs> I think there's a really good question. Kenny was one of the first out to ask it, which is about finding truth in a, a backdrop of increasing misinformation, and increasingly sophisticated methods of misinformation. Uh, and it is a really difficult one that we need to d discuss. Um, for me, what I've seen is, uh, again, it speaks to an earlier point, a huge diversity of information amongst the pirate communities that we've seen, you know, a non-reliance on singular news feeds and an ability to not just subscribe to one message. And, and that's what we see in you know, a post-truth age. People become tribalistic about either the political party, the news source or whatever else it is. But instead of that, an ability to edit, to take numerous and conflicting media stories and points of information and then triangulate and then put it across your own personal truth. And that seems to be one of the big aspects of this. People who spend time with themselves, people who spend time with the questions about morality, people who just aren't on the critical offensive, but knowing what your own truth, your own moral standpoint is. So then you've got something that, that acts as a polarity at the center of the triangulation of information, not all of which can be trusted. And then what are my core personal beliefs? And it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a human algorithm against the overwhelming larger algorithm. It's not an answer to the computational propaganda, but it is at least a way to begin to dissect it and be able to take your own decisions. The points I made about COVID makes it pretty difficult for democrat uh, civil disobedience. Someone else said, you know, millions of us marched on the streets. Yeah, I grew up, my earliest memories are, are on marches or sitting at Greenham Common with my mum. It's where I feel like I came into the world. Um, and yeah, the part of being part of the student marches and nothing changed, being part of the, the march against the World War, nothing changed. And that's the big difference with what happened with Extinction Rebellion. It did change. The agenda was changed. The conversation changed, whether you think about it from a, a media level of conversation or you think about that they weren't good enough, but some of the big conversations of declaring emergencies that took place right at central government, the formation of the citizens' assemblies around climate that took place. Yes, there's flaws to all of those, but something was very different from that first set of demonstrations. And there wasn't the, the, the different in, in the element was the, the anger, the energy and the, 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 the nonviolent direct action that came on the back of it. So the question isn't that that's hard to do in a digital only COVID space. Of course it is. But everything has had to move in that direction. And so the brief to us is how do we go in that direction? Much as it is, you know, how are we going to stand up against, you know, we're not going to deconstruct capitalism overnight, but we do need to exist in a less growth environment. So how do we do that? How do we make more without it being making more? So the, the, the big questions of that which sit behind all of this, I think, our own truths, the reorganization of democracy, you know, what nonviolence disobedience looks like at work, you know, and on Zoom, that's the macro brief that sits to a creative community like this. And it's really important that we stay at that wide lens, the, 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 with the aperture as far out as we can and not be pulled into the always the minutia. Awesome. I'm just following all the chat here. Has anyone else got something that would like to say? Not in chat, in real life. Well, not real life. <laughs> uh, Hello. In real life. Um, <laughs> I I've seen some of you already this, this afternoon, but uh, yeah, I'm in Nottingham in the uh, Grand old tier three plus now, I hear. Uh, that's the latest uh, status we've got. But I've got, I've got, um, a slightly moral piratical dilemma in that I'm part of a large organization, um, a voluntary women's organization, um, that at the moment is, excuse my French, taking the piss out of the members. And they have put through something that I think is fundamentally incorrect as far as a consultation is concerned at a time when a lot of very elderly women are not contactable. They're not coming to meetings. They're not on email. They're not on Zoom all the time. And it's something that's going to fundamentally undermine the organization. 
and there is me and about half a dozen people out of 200,000 that are fighting against it. And how do I do that without destroying it? I'm not telling you what it is, obviously, but you may have guessed. But I don't want to go to the press. I'm, I'm now at that last point. We've gone to the Charity Commission and we're waiting for the results of that. But everyone's saying go to the press, go to the press. But I love it and I want to be in it forever. And I'm scared. Mm. I open it up to the pirates for any worthy advice. I mean, now, how, do you, how do you change something without killing it? <laughs> I, I have I've literally sat in that exact dilemma of going, I kind of love what you represent, but you've corrupted it so much that what do you, where do you go from there? Especially when you feel like you're going to affect people in it that don't deserve to be affected in that way. No. Um, I think that my personal answer to that has actually been has been this has been if you can't change what um what the thing that you're tr that you truly love is or or if it looks like it's too strong mm. you have to create the alternative yourself i know that sounds like maybe quite a big ask um but it is essentially the proving of the new way so if there's if you know if there's a new kind of culture that you want to create or a different way of doing it you kind of have to step into that space and be like, okay, here's the new kind of network, whatever. That might feel like too big a thing when you're like in it. Yeah, it's the problem being that it's not work. It's an organization that I'm in, that I've joined. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a social thing more than anything else. However, it is massive <laughs> and it is the structures that are in place mean that in order to uh, get to any kind of level of, hierarchy where I could make change it's a time period thing you have to be at a certain level for two years before you can get to the next level and then another level for two years before you can get to the next level and then you go that thing I was talking about four years ago it's still going it's like that so um yeah whilst I can I can do so much this decision they're taking at the moment is very very time um determined and we've got literally days now and unless I do something really ridiculous um, or go to the press, it's going to go ahead. So, I mean, my, my, my experience of what I think sounds similar has been very much within kind of youth sector space. And you've got people on the ground who can absolutely see the problem. And then you've got multiple, multiple layers. And yes. then you've got people with lots of other interests and influences that are on the top. Yes. And the problem within the situations I've experienced, or actually the beginning of this whole movement, there was a really good example, going to the press on it is going to cause conflict. And on the whole, most people are trying to do the best thing they can, right? They're, they're well intended, and they can't necessarily see the, all the implications of what they're doing, and they can't see it the way you are. So if you were to present that as a conflict situation, you're going to find yourself in the further conflict and move further away from the solution. So, you know, it's a nuclear option. And I, I think you're right to observe Caution. So there are two strategies that I've seen. One was uh, across the youth sector in, in, in the Southwest. And the principle there was, you know, deeply entrenched arguments. It takes a long time. I read a thing in social movements. It takes 21 points of an argument to get someone to come about to your position. So that's not going to happen in the time frame that you've got. The one thing that people do follow that always gathers momentum is not pleading or saying you're doing it wrong, but it's to demonstrate success. And this can happen incredibly quickly. So whatever the, the better way of doing it that you're, you're thinking is, the, the, the vulnerable women who aren't using forms of communication, if there is a person-to-person, -person, whatever the, the alternative is, to be able to demonstrate that it works mm -hmm. and evidence that very quickly, typically is the thing that gets large groups of people excited. And success follows momentum. And we found this to the case when we were running some funded projects where we went out and said, we're in trouble and we're going to shut down if we're not supported. That didn't work. When we said, we've come up with the best model there is and it's less money than anyone else is working with and these are the evidence and the outcomes, then all of a sudden we were able to access support in, in ways that other people couldn't. The, the second approach that works yeah. time and again is to m map the, the very specific strategic points of influence. And, and if it's a 200,000 people and you're only half a dozen, <laughs> of course, there's a scalable issue there, but there is somebody at a higher level that will agree with you. There is somebody that you can't, you know, there is no one, 
there's only there's six degrees of separation with everyone. There's only two degrees of separation with pirates. There will be a pirate up there who also knows this is wrong and perhaps hasn't seen the perspectives that you've got. So it's not that you've got to convince 200,000 people. You've possibly got to convince two people. So your job over the next few days is That's not... The trouble. Well, we've done that. That's the trouble. We've gone to the board. We've gone to yep. um, people of influence. And um, there's a gatekeeper who has then intervened. So that person is is the person that's giving all this information into the people that should be making the decisions, and it's misinformation. And we've been we've been basically told we're not we're not allowed to talk about what you know the proposals that we've put forward. But we're doing the full going the full pirate and just going. Do you know what? Fuck it. This is last ditch. We'll just share it with everybody because it's good stuff. You know, it's yeah. a good proposal. Well, that so sounds that sounds like a sensible part. You know, the person yeah. the person there feels threatened. They feel that their job is being undermined. And if they're the gay people, then they're trying to do their job. I know. But rather than go to the press, go go around them. That sounds like the right rebellion to make. Okay. Thank you for your practical advice. If you Martin. want to talk that one through, it sounds like me and Alex have got specific experience and it might help if you want to share the detail. You've got Alex's email. We're more than happy to have a chat about that. Thank you. That's really kind. Thank you. Hmm. We can see if there's anyone else who wants to raise a point. Hi y'all, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. I'm Hi. Sure. Hi, so I'm from Texas actually and I was wondering if it was possible if I could learn how to take it back to the like international stage if y'all have any advice on that and also if you have any advice on being a POC in the community as well. Thanks. Hmm. International stage. Well, we've we've done these talks in lots of different contexts, actually, and have found surprisingly that it does seem to translate. Um, I've done a few in Spain. Sam, I think, even took it to. Would you go Turkey and Singapore? I've been, I've been in Texas with it. I have, oh God, you have, haven't you? Yeah. Yep. Wow. I forgot about that. <laughs> the rebellion we came up with in Texas was to make a black. Uh, it was with all. It was with the original founders of Kentucky Fried Chicken. So we took it right back to that business, and there was a huge set of rebellions about the veganization of Kentucky Fried Chicken, how they move away from sugary products, how they move away from battery farmed hens, and the biggest rebellion that came out of the whole thing was a plan to make the next uh, Colonel feature in a Super Bowl advert a black Colonel to truly represent the history of the organization where it comes from. So. You know, there's no shortage of pirates willing to take on the challenging cultural and local issues in the States and, and in many other territories too. Uh, we've got a few friends over there. So drop uh, Alex a line and we can introduce you to the, the emerging pirate chapters. And please help us. We can put you in touch with the American publishers and, and, and let's take it away. Yeah, uh, totally. You're so right. That's so relevant. <laughs> and But I would also say like about the, you know, being a, a person of color in a, in in this pirate, pirate movement, it was a question that Sam asked me really, really early on about how do you, you know, is this speaking to, to levels of privilege that not everybody has access to? But I also think it's just been such a, an important and fascinating, uh, like, yeah, moment with Black Lives Matter that was sort of what I think we were trying to get at in the beginning of all of this, or what I was trying to get at, having worked in charities for so long and realizing that in terms of levers of change, charity kind of is, is like, putting often not always but a lot of them putting like plasters on symptoms rather than uprooting the root cause of why the problems occur in the first place and similarly things like even protests and petitions have their limitations and we've done these modes of change for so long um you know in the uk the biggest protest we had over iraq didn't work so what i was really searching for in this was new like levers for change. And I think this idea of unpicking systems through rule breaking really felt like it was something new. Um, and I think that came through, at least in the UK here, so much with Black Lives Matter, where for the first time I saw people who would never usually join in any kind of um, socially, like social movement saying, oh shit, you're right. My, my saying nothingness is something. And there is actually a really small thing that I can do, like a, a, not even a rule break, a stepping out of convention, like a kind of turning onto a different track, just even just sharing something that I didn't, that is me, is me playing a part. And it's the first time I actually didn't think that, there, you know, that it was just kind of virtue signaling or slacktivism and stuff. It was the first time I go, okay, I'm seeing a ripple effect. I'm seeing like um, this really, 
um, take hold in people I'd never. So whatever happened in that was really, really powerful. It, it definitely in communities that I'd seen here forced people to look at things in a different way and recognize that they were sitting on levers that they didn't even realize they were just from being in a company, in a, a professional position, being a person who's in charge of the social media there, or is it a slight decision maker there, not even at the top of the organization, but there were just these, these moments that they go, oh, okay. And it took, you know, that, that just raising of awareness, it doesn't have to be, you know, I think for people of color, I think you don't have to put yourself on the line all the time. Like that's, that was the clear message that came through. Like there are so many, there are so many untapped levers. Um, and when Sam and I first talking, started talking about being more private, that was the, the kind of message um, that we talked about. Like we want, we wanted to be able to awaken that a little bit. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. You've got one more question from James Newton and then people are, are going. So we should probably jump to that and then. James. Yes, I got the last one in. Great. Uh, thanks very much, guys. That's really, really good. And um, I just really, really enjoyed it. I've, I've, yeah, I'm really, really impressed. A question I had, and I know that um, Rebecca, Owen, Rich, everyone else that set this up is that, you know, we've got a network of people in York that are disruptors and people that want to see change. And I suppose in the context of COVID and um, how we can go about doing that, have, have you seen a, a network of uh, you know, a citywide network of people come together to try and form a crew and try to take things on on a bigger scale. You know, have you got any case studies for that? And and if you have, what do you what do you think has has made them successful? What's been the first sort of few steps to take? Hmm. It is yeah, it's a good, really good question. It's a hard one for. Um, I say there's a city. I mean, we already had sort of geographical. Um, uh, kind of crews formed before. So there's a sense of like, you know, an ability to continue what you'd already started and just kind of moving it online um, versus starting a new thing in a COVID area for a city, which, you know, is slightly more challenging. Um, I would say, like, I know I just, I'm going to flag it again. I'd say that like Dina, as one of our pirates, has a really great, like, um, is doing really great stuff around joining people within a kind of not quite a citywide context but within a locality context so she's a really great person to ask more about that rather than to ask me um, we have our like our pirates across Manchester who've I guess already had such strong networks that you know it's it's been maintained through Covid um, I guess one I kind of thought on that one with okay. something that really inspired me was the um the early arrival of so many uh, when we saw a geographic cluster emerge